Well, we all know Google, and I bet we all use one or a couple of their products. Uh, what products are there besides the search? Well, there's, for example, Gmail, there's Google+, Plus, there is Google Calendar, Google Docs, Google Maps, Google Keep, Google Forms, Google Play, Google Sheets, Google Music, Google Slides, YouTube, and all of these apps are really cool. They're in fact even platforms that you can use when you create your own apps. So let's say for a practical example, you create an app that uses Gmail. For example, our email scheduling app that is an extension of Gmail. Now you use all of this information, all of the services that are already provided by Google Gmail. And the question just is, how can you use these services in the most efficient way when you're just developing a mobile app and not the server side component like Gmail? Now, luckily Google provides for all of its apps and all of its services an API. So an API is basically like a socket that you can plug in this information, which is available over the API, is actually the same information that you can see when you log in to the native web application of Gmail. It's just not nicely formatted because this information available over the API is to be consumed by machines or by other software and not directly by humans. Now, because all this information is available and this is private information, so that's why this information is protected and that's also why the APIs need to be protected. And they are protected by a mechanism called OAuth, right? This mechanism that we've studied already. So before you can access any of these apps and any of their data and any of their services of Google, you first need to go through OAuth. And that can be complicated. You need to have um, all these steps lined up in your app. And that's why I created this OAuth cheat sheet for Google. I would like to show you how all of these different pieces work together, how the OAuth flow actually works. So before we get started with the practical example of getting our hands dirty and digging in the OAuth and actually going through the example, I would like to take a step back and look at all the different components and all the flows that we will later on do. Because when we look at the code and we look at the HTTP requests we send out later, it's easy to lose track of it. So first, let's go through a nice graphical description of what OAuth for accessing Gmail actually looks like. So we have all our elements in place. There is Gmail, which is the resource server. There is an app on your mobile and there's some kind of security mechanism. Now this maps to what we've seen before, to all of these components we've seen before. Here they are. The resource server, Gmail, it contains all the resources through the resource server and its API, we can gain access to the resources, which are emails for Gmail. And then we have, of course, our own app and we have the security mechanism, which is the OAuth server and it actually has two endpoints. It has the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint that we need to access from our app. And then there is the resource owner, Joe. Joe has his emails on Gmail. So he owns these emails on his account and he can identify himself. He can authenticate using his credential with this little key. Now, before we can get started, there are a couple of things that need to be in place. First, of course, Joe needs to have an account with Gmail. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't work. And also, another thing is that the app that we develop needs to be an app that's registered with Google. The outcome of this is actually this red key that you see here. This red key symbolizes the client ID and the client credential. And only if the app is registered, the whole OAuth flow that we look at really can take place. So the first step of the OAuth authorization code flow, which we'll look at, is that the 
app, my app, sends a request to the authorization endpoint. And in this request, it just says, this is my client ID. Uh, it doesn't send the secret yet. And I would like to have access to emails in general. It just specifies I would like to have access to emails. It doesn't say which email specifically. It just says something about the type of resource that it wants to have access to. Now the auth server validates that and typically when everything's okay, it just forwards the request to the resource owner and says, hey resource owner, first I want you to authenticate yourself. And it does that by sending a login screen on a web on a web page to the resource owner. The resource owner then uses his credential to authenticate uh, on the auth server and the auth server goes and checks these credentials, these passwords against some database that's available in the background of the auth server. And once the auth server thinks that's okay, it generates uh, another web page. And on this web page, it says, well, do you really want to allow the app called my app to, to grant this app access to your emails. And it sends that to the resource owner. And now the resource owner can answer that question with yes or no. Typically answers yes, I would like this app to have access to my emails. And if that's also okay, if the user has granted access, if it has consented to the request of the app, um, then it creates first an authorization code. This authorization code is here depicted by this red barcode. And this authorization code goes then back to the app. This has a very short validity period, usually just a couple of minutes. And in this validity period, the app now has to authenticate. We now want to verify the identity of the app. And how do we do this? Well, we do it with the red key. And the red key contains the client ID and especially the client secret which is only known to the app and to the OAuth server. So this is sent, client ID and client secret, together with the authorization code, which we just received from the authorization endpoint. And this is sent to the token endpoint, both of these things. And on the token endpoint, they're verified. They check it back against the database. Is this client ID, client secret really the right thing? Uh, is the redirect URI matching to that? Is the authorization code really valid? All these checks are done on the token endpoint. If they are all okay, lots of things can go wrong, but if they're all okay, then an access token is created. This access token is sent back to the application. Now the application needs to store this access token securely. Usually this is valid for some amount of time, might be a day, might be an hour. It needs to store this access token securely. And now we're, when we have this access token, the app is in the situation to access resources. So for example, it wants to access a specific email. In that request, it sends along the access token. All right, so I want to access the email and here's my access token. It sends it to the resource server. The resource server in this API for accessing the resource does a couple of checks. And the first check is, hey, is this access token really valid? And for doing that, it doesn't really know if the access token is valid. So it sends off this request to the OAuth server, to this verify endpoint. And here the OAuth server checks this access token against this database in the background. Is it still valid? Has it ever been valid? And is this for the right client? And is there, does it contain the right scope? So is this type of access really granted by the user? All these checks are done on the OS server and a result comes back, a yes or a no. The resource server reacts to that result. And in the happy case, it just forwards that request to the resource, accesses the resource from the database and gives it back to the application. And that's about it. Now the app has access to the email. Now we've learned how this is done basically on paper. But in the following lecture, I will show you how we do this in practice. What you need to get ready for this lecture is you need to get an account for Google. If you don't already have one, you can just use the one that you already have. 
or, and you also need to get curl ready. Curl is a little tool that you can find online. It's available for all systems. It's available for Linux, for OS X, for, for Microsoft Windows. This tool allows you to do all of these types of HTTP requests that are required in OAuth 2.0.